We are back, and we are going to love Romans, learn so much from the Apostle Paul as we go through, continue to go through this book of Romans. And uh, I have a question for you. Have you ever talked to yourself? Raise your hand if you've ever talked to yourself. Yeah, it's something we do, right? I'll find myself chatting with myself, having a whole conversation. And I like to think of that as I'm talking to Jesus. Instead of talking to myself, I'm having a conversation with the Lord, who I know is right there with me. So now you have a little insight into to my crazy mind. But uh, one, one type of person, I know my voice is kind of echoey and crazy, but you know we'll get through it together. Uh, one person that I love to hear talk to themselves is like toddlers. Have you ever heard a toddler just have a whole conversation just playing in the corner? Yeah, my daughter is nodding because she knows who I'm going to talk about. So my niece, Pia, I don't know if some of you might know her, uh, Megan and Nathan's daughter who do the upstairs service in the morning, but she is like, what, two? And uh, she will sit, we, we'll, we'll be doing something, talking, playing a game, and we'll just hear just gibberish, chatter for like... 15 minutes at a time, and we love to just stop and listen. And Evie will, because she watches Pia a lot, my daughter back there, she'll hear her talking. But she's just carrying on talking. No one knows what she's saying. It's just, it's just nonsense. It's, I mean, she knows how to talk, but you can't follow the whole conversation. But it's so fun to hear, hear a, a little toddler have a, have a conversation and, and practice their talking. But yeah, we all talk to ourselves sometimes, some of us more than others. Did you know Paul talked to himself, the Apostle Paul? So tonight in Romans chapter 3, we're going to hear Paul kind of talk to himself. I mean, we only have four verses, so it's short, but this week and next week, Paul has a conversation uh, with himself, and I'll show you where, uh, why we can say that, why we see that, um, but, but that's what we're covering tonight. So we're in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to do the first four verses tonight. Romans chapter 3, 1 through 4. And uh, so we, kind of before the holidays and stuff, we, we covered the, uh, chapter 2. And remember, Paul in these chapters is basically laying out the case at the beginning of Romans that ultimately all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Gentiles, they are accountable to God because they know him from what they see and, and kind of uh, what's around them, the, the natural created order and that God has designed such a, such a universe and, and God uh, reveals himself to them. Jews are held even more accountable almost because they have the law and they have circumcision. And we talked about how uh, the, the Jews were saying, wait, but you can't say that we're under God's judgment. We have the law. We have God's own very words. And Paul's like, no, 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 that just means you're under the same judgment and you are unfaithful to that law. And then they said, well, we have circumcision. We have the sign of the covenant. And Paul said, no, that doesn't save you either. It's, it's what you do and what you have done has shown that you are unrighteous and deserving of judgment as well. So uh, the, the last couple uh, messages we had, we had our apostle Paul up here. There he is. He's busy writing because he has to write a lot of the New Testament. And he said, I have leveled the playing field. In chapter 2, he said, I've leveled the playing field between Gentiles and Jews. Everyone is under God's judgment. Everyone is deserving God's wrath. Gentiles and Jews. And we had our, our guy here, our Pharisee, our, our, our faithful Jew at the time of Jesus say, well, what about the law? And we covered that, and Paul covered that. And, he said, and then he said, what about circumcision? And Paul kind of shot that one down too. So now our, our guy up here is exasperated, and he says, then what's the point? Then what's the point? If you tell me the law is no benefit to me, I'm still under God's judgment and wrath. If you tell me circumcision is no benefit to me, I'm still under God's judgment and wrath, then what's the point? And I got this, this same feeling very, on a very, very minimal scale about 20 minutes ago because the Seahawks kicked a field goal in overtime 
and beat the Rams, which means the Lions can't make the playoffs. I know you guys are all super depressed. Sorry, I like sports, so I always bring it up. But, uh, and, and I want to think, like, okay, the whole season, what was the point? Right? But no, there, there, there was a point. They grew as a team and got good, whatever, whatever. But this guy is, is like, okay, if, if you're taking away everything that is important about the people of God, the people of Israel, the Jews, then what was the point of all that? He can look back to the Old Testament and say, what, what was the point of all the promises? All the, all the different things that God did for the nation of Israel, for the people of Israel. That's, the, that's what, God, what Paul God, through Paul, is going to address tonight. So let's take a look at our passage. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 1. So Paul brings this up. He says, Then what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Again, he shot down the idea that, that the law protected me, was like, a, was like a coat that protected me from God's judgment. He shot down the idea that circumcision protected me from God's judgment. So then, what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? What's the point? Why did God give those things? Well, he answers himself in verse 2. Do you see how he's having a dialogue with himself? He says, great in every respect. So what was the point? What was the purpose of these things? Well, it was great in every respect. And when you read those words, in every respect there, it's not necessarily like in everything that, that, that benefited the Jews in every aspect of the whole universe. It's in many different things, in many different ways. That's what Paul's saying. It, it was a benefit in many different ways. And here are, he, in chapter 9, we'll cover in a few months, but... In chapter 9, he lists a lot of these benefits. In Romans 9, 4 through 5, he says, he's, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about himself as one of the Jews and his countrymen. He says, to whom belong the adoption as sons and daughters. So they were adopted by God. The glory, they had glory because they were in a relationship with God. The covenants, all those covenants with, with Abraham, with, with Moses and the people of Israel, with David, God made covenants with these people. The giving of the law, God's instructions on how to live the best possible life, the temple service, and the promises, the, the ability to worship God and all those promises, some of which we talked about this morning, if you were here this morning, uh, and, and the promises that God made. Whose are the fathers? So the promises were for the fathers and for them as, as the descendants. And from whom is the Christ? according to the flesh. So Christ is a descendant. He's a Jew, right? Jesus was a Jew. He was a descendant of the people of Israel. He was a descendant of David. So there, there are good things. There are great things about being a Jew. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, no, no, no. These things aren't negated. So the point he was making is not necessarily that these things are meaningless, that the signs that God gave, that the covenants got, that God made, that the promises that God made to, to the people of Israel were meaningless. That's not what he's saying. He's saying they just won't protect them when it comes to God's judgment if they are unfaithful. If the people who, who were given all those things and made those covenants are unfaithful, then that's, those things aren't going to be good enough to protect them. They're still under God's wrath. But those things are still important. And he says in verse 2, first... So, so uh, of greatest importance, that they were entrusted with the actual words of God, that they were entrusted with the actual words of God. And, and look at that, entrusted. Think about that word. We just had a babysitter uh, watch my kids the other night, and what did we do? We entrusted her with my children, right? We, we trusted her to take good care, to make sure nothing bad happens, to make sure they don't bite each other's heads off like they do when we're taking care of them. We entrusted our kids to them. God entrusted his actual words to these people. So he, he, he gave them over and, and trusted them to keep them. And when, when he talks about words, it's it, the, kind of the word there is oracles. Uh, it's, it's really pointing to God's covenants and God's promises that was given to these people, and, and almost, you could say, the whole Old Testament. 
but those things were actually entrusted to the people. That's a good thing. That's an important thing. What does that mean? If, if I actually have someone's words, if, if they actually will carry on a conversation with me, talk to me, get to know me, that means I'm in a relationship with them. And Israel is, was the only nation that had this relationship with God, that he actually spoke to them in a way that was specific and gave them the, the, the perfect way to live and all these things. God, what it ultimately means is God entered into a relationship with them. He trusted them and he called on them to trust him. That's what this means. That's why, it's, that's why it was so important. Paul's saying, no, these things were of vital importance. These things were super important. This was the righteousness of God. And we see this idea in the Old Testament and even in the, the, um, some, some uh, readings that the Jews would do during the time of, of Jesus and of Paul uh, that aren't in the Bible, but Deuteronomy 4.8 in the Old Testament, he says, or what great nation is there that has, that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I'm setting before you today. So God's saying there's not a nation like this. You, you're actually given my law, my words. There's, there's no nation like this. And Psalm 147 says, he declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not, not dealt this way with any other nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. So Israel knew, they had this idea that they were special because God gave them the law, gave them his words, gave them his instruction, ultimately entered into a relationship with them. And Paul's saying, no, that's vitally important. That's so important. But he goes on in verse 3. Because you might be saying, yeah, but they weren't faithful to it. it. It didn't end well for Israel. I mean, we've been going through the whole book of Ezekiel, and it's all, whoa, whoa, judgment, judgment, because they turned away from him, because they were idolaters, because they were wicked, because they, they, they practiced injustice. So... Paul, you can hear himself bringing this up. He can, he can sense that, okay, in this argument, there's a potential hole. I need, to, I need to address that. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? So he entrusted these things to the people, and what did they do? They proved to be untrustworthy. It says, if some did not believe their unbelief or their, their unrighteousness will not nullify the faithfulness of God. God is still faithful. Just because one person in a relationship messes up doesn't mean the other person messed up too. Right? It doesn't mean both of them are unfaithful. Even if some believed, it will not nullify the faithfulness of God. So Paul is saying that, yeah, they were given all these things, and yeah, they messed up, just like I had just talked about in chapter 2. They weren't faithful to the covenants. They weren't faithful to, to what God called them to do, therefore bringing them under God's judgment, but that doesn't mean God is unfaithful. He's absolutely faithful. And you notice he says there. That's how we know Paul isn't talking about Jewish Christians necessarily. He's not talking about himself. Now he's talking about unbelieving Jews. Their unbelief, he's saying there, will not nullify the faithfulness of God. Just because they rejected God, just because they rejected the Messiah, doesn't mean God's unfaithful. He says, far from it. You can hear him. He's, he's fired up now. He's like, no, this is not right thinking. Rather, God must prove to be true, though every person be found as a liar. God, so he's saying even if every person, everyone rejected God, all the people of Israel, the whole world said, forget you, God, we don't want anything to do with you, rejected God, God would still be true. You can see Israel's unfaithfulness, Versus God's faithfulness, even, through, even in their unbelief, even in their wickedness, even in their turning away from God, God is still faithful. God is still faithful. 
And he quotes Psalm 51, so that you are justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. What's Psalm 51 about? So Psalm 51, David wrote right after, uh, basically, he was called out by the prophet Nathan for committing adultery, uh, among other things, for, for stealing Uriah's wife. David was called out, and Nathan said, you are the man, and David wrote this psalm, Psalm 51, in response. And it's a psalm of, of, uh, of confession. It's a psalm of lament. He's, he's saying, yes, I did wrong, and he admits his sin, and he says to God, you are justified in your words. So God, God condemns him. God says, you, you were wrong to do this. You, you turned away from the right way, and you did the wrong thing. You were wicked, and, Jesus, and, and David said, so you are justified. He's saying that God is justified in what he said to him. And prevail when you are judged, or prevail when you judge. So, so David's saying, no, you're, when you, the flip side of a relationship with God is, okay, I was wicked, I rejected him, and I was judged, and I was held accountable. And David's saying, even when that happens, though it's terrible for me, you're still righteous, you're still justified. It's the right thing. You didn't do any wrong, I did. You can hear David saying that. So God must prove to be true, though every person be found as a liar. So maybe, maybe some things have happened in your life. Maybe some things have happened in our lives and you've turned away from God or other people have hurt you or things haven't gone exactly the way that you think, that you thought it would. God is still faithful. His promises still stand. Sin is a thing. People are wicked sometimes. Ourselves, we are wicked sometimes. And like I talked about this morning, we, we can mess things up. We can try and rule our own lives, run our own lives. But even though we do that, God is still faithful. And we got to think, what does that mean? That if I turn away from God, I decide not to be the person he wants me to be, not act like the person that he wants me to act like, not be obedient to him. Him being still being faithful, what does that mean? Is that going to be good for me? Or is that going to come with some consequences? Because Paul is saying that the people of Israel, they had all these wonderful things. They had the promises. They had that whole list he lays out in Romans 9, and they were awesome things. They were a blessing to them. The, the Messiah got to come from their nation. They got to, to walk in an in a intimate relationship with God, hear from him. They got to worship him how he should be worshiped, not these false gods. And he gave them guidance how to do that. These were all amazing blessings for them. But the covenants that God enters into had a flip side, right? Blessings and curses. So when they decide to turn away from all that goodness, when they decide to, to turn their back on it, they receive judgment. They receive wrath. And God was still faithful. Because that covenant had blessings and curses. And God was faithful whether they took the blessings or whether they took the curses. God was justified. He was righteous in what he did, whether blessings or curses. It's kind of like, I feel like in a lot of movies or TV shows, people say, well, I'm doing it with you or without you. You can come with if you want, but we're going anyway. You know, it's, it's kind of this, this with or without you idea, and God will be glorified. The end of everything is, is God's glory, and he will be glorified with or without you. With or without your faithfulness to him, your faith, your trust in him. And they knew this in the Old Testament and in the intertestamental period too. Nehemiah 9 says, Now then, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps his covenant and faithfulness. So they came back from exile and they're remembering their history. 
He says, however, you are righteous in everything that has happened to us. So this is after the exile. This is after all that. For you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. So this, this is something that's recognized in the Old Testament. The Psalm of Solomon, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, this was, like I said, one of these devotional readings they read uh, that were important to them during the time of, of the apostles. It says, And may the devout justify the judgment of their God when sinners are removed from the presence of the righteous, the man pleaser who speaks the law with deceit. So you can see that they're, they're not mad at God and his judgment. Now you can also see some of their kind of self-righteousness starting to creep in in this passage as well uh, that we talked about in chapter two. But they knew that God was righteous even when he judged. So even when he makes all these promises, all these things, uh, he, he enters into these covenants and it ends up with unfaithfulness and judgment, they knew that, okay, but God is still righteous. God is still just. So you are justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So uh, there's a couple, couple questions that come up. Here's the question. Are you going to be faithful or unfaithful? Because God will be glorified either way. It's up to you. Are you going to put your faith in Christ, walk with him, trust him to save you from your sins? I mean, think of all the amazing blessings we have as Christians. God himself, we just talked about Christmas. God himself came as a little helpless baby and he subjected himself to the, to the worst of human abuse, emotional, physical, verbal, was tortured and killed so that we could have eternal life, so that our sins are not counted against us. Is there a greater blessing in the universe than that? And then, what's more, he, he rose again, three day, he rose from the dead three days later so that we would also rise and, and have eternal life with him in, in the new heaven and new earth that we talked about this morning from Ezekiel. The promises of God, we even sang that this morning, that these promises that God makes to us through Christ. It's an amazing blessing that, that, there's amazing blessings that God gives to his people. He gives to his people who trust and follow him. Who trust and follow him. I can say I'm a Christian. I can say I go to church. I can say I do good things. I'm a good person. But am I gonna be faithful to what God calls me to? Or am I gonna be unfaithful? That's the question. Because we know the promises. We know the, the, the new covenant that we've entered into with, with the Lord. We know the different promises he's given us. He's promised us uh, eternal life, uh, which starts here and now, right? He's, he's, he's promised us a wisdom. He's promised us all kinds of things. But here are a couple things that we also need to keep in mind. James, we just did James. We preached through the book of James right before Romans. 2.14, you guys know it. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? In other words, I can say I'm a Christian. I can say, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I'm a nice person. But I don't love people unless they're, you know, my family or whatever. I don't show people God's love. I don't seek to help people. I don't seek to grow closer to God and, and know him more. I kind of just check off the boxes. Well, can that faith save, one, save someone? James is laying out the flip side, right? We have all these promises. The Jews, Israel had all these promises that they could hang on to, that, but it just became a surface thing. Yeah, we have the law. We have circumcision. And those are awesome, amazing things. Yeah, we have Jesus. We have salvation. We have the law of Christ, the right way to live. We have righteousness, and those are all awesome things, but may they not become surface to us and just something we talk about and we say and not something that is deep down inside of us because it always comes back to relationship. Always comes back to relationship. That's what God started with Israel. The covenants was his relationship with them. He wanted a relationship with his people and they turned away with him. 
God, through Christ, makes it possible for us to have an intimate relationship with him, his spirit living inside us. But what is a relationship? If I never talk to my wife, and I say, I just like living in the same house as you, you know, we'll raise our kids, whatever, are we, what, how is our relationship going to do? It's going to fall apart, right? In order to have a relationship with someone, you need to know someone. A relationship is communication. It's trust. With God, it's obedience. And that's what James is saying. Faith without works is dead. Are you going to be faithful or are you going to be, or are you going to be unfaithful? Because God will be glorified either way. Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, he says, and this is shocking. It would have been shocking to the hearers and it's even shocking as I read it now. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. So it's not even just the works, right? It's doing the will of God. It's doing... The right, I mean, these people are going around casting out demons and, and performing many miracles. Wow, I've never done that. I mean, those are some works, right? So what's the problem? But they weren't doing the will of the Father, which means they weren't in a relationship with God. They didn't know God. They just did these things because they thought they were cool or they thought they were powerful or they thought they were important. They th maybe even they thought this is what God wanted, but God wants a relationship. That's what it looks like. I don't want you to hear these things thinking, oh, geez, like, am I saved or am I going to be like Israel? You know, it, it's not that. It's think about your relationship. Think about if you are faithful to what God has called you to do. If you know him, because then you will follow him. That's what James is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. If you truly put your faith, your trust in Jesus to save you from your sins and are given eternal life, then you will have, you will have no choice. You're no longer a slave to sin, but you're a slave to righteousness. You will walk obediently with the Lord. Yeah, everyone messes up and, and no one's perfect, but you will know God's will and you will follow him obediently. You won't be doing these empty things. You won't be saying, yeah, I feed the homeless because that's what I'm supposed to do, I guess. Yeah, I uh, am an usher at church because my wife told me to, and so I'm going to do that because that's what a church person does. Right? No, you're going you're gonna to have an intimate relationship with the God of the universe through his son, Jesus. That's what he says. So the question is, are you going to be part of the blessing so are you going to be faithful or unfaithful? Are you going to be part of the blessing or the judgment? That's what Paul is saying in this passage. God is glorified either way. Jesus could have died on the cross. No one ever put their faith in him. And God would be glorified. God would be faithful. But God desires our salvation. He says, I do not delight in the death of the wicked. Just because he's glorified doesn't mean he delights in it. And he wants you, he wants me, he wants all of us to know him, to know his joy, to know his, his hope, to know, know his love, to give that, to, to emanate that to others. That's what he wants. So are you going to be part of the blessing or the judgment? It's easy to make that choice, right? You see that and you're like, oh, okay, blessing. <laughs> I'll be part of the blessing. No, I don't want to be part of the judgment. But it's so hard, it's so much harder to, to put that into practice, right? Right? So as, as you think about this passage, as you think about what Paul said in these four short verses, I want you to think about yourself and, and, and where do you fit? Because I can say I want to be part of the blessing, but am I willing to do what it takes to, to actually be part of the blessing? Jesus says you basically have to die to yourself and give yourself fully to him. He says count the cost, right? Jesus says count the cost of being his disciple, of being his follower. So am I willing to do what it takes to be part of the blessing? Israel, they had all these promises, they had all these blessings, but they didn't want to do what it took 
to be part of the blessing? Do I want to do what it takes to be part of the blessing? To seek God. Seek what he wants from me. Seek the kind of person he wants me to be. Seek the kind of people he wants me to surround myself with. Seek the kinds of things that he wants me to do. The kinds of things that he wants me to say. The kinds of things that he wants me to think. Am I willing to put all that out there to him and not keep that control? Because that control leads to judgment. That control leads not to God, but further and further away from him. So are you going to be faithful or are you going to be unfaithful? Are you going to be part of the blessing or part of the judgment? Because God is glorified either way. That sounds depressing. Don't be depressed. I just want you to think about, where are you in this? Where are you in this? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word and this short passage in Romans. We thank you that you uh, inspired the Apostle Paul to, to point this out, that when you give promises, when you give blessings, when you save people, even if they turn away from you, you're, you're still faithful, and those things are still amazing. And with that knowledge, we know that you want us all to be saved. We know you want us all to follow you, to, to receive your forgiveness. I pray for all of us tonight, Lord, that you will convict us where we need to change and, and not go down the road of judgment, but go down the road of blessing, where we need to, to be more faithful to you and not unfaithful to what you've called us to be, to what you've called us to, to do. So I pray for wisdom and, and guidance and courage for all of us to give ourselves to you and to give ourselves fully to an all-in relationship with you, Lord, because you pointed out that there will be people that kind of wanted it halfway. They, they wanted what they wanted, but they also wanted to be known as your follower, be known as someone who does things in your name. May we not go halfway, Lord. Give us the strength and courage to follow you fully and be a part of the blessing, to be faithful to you, Lord. Be with us the rest of the night and all this week. In your name we pray, amen.